Good morning, Anthem. Are you guys doing well? Generally speaking, some of you better than others. Awesome. Hey, we are uh, glad you guys are here worshiping with us this morning. It is just always a treat to be able to worship. Um, and it's, it's fun watching these groups of volunteer worship teams kind of culminate and lead. And it was fun watching Nick, who's his first time leading, and these guys working together. And it's just been fun. And so we thank you that you guys get it. I hope that this is not a performance. You are not attending a concert. These are just real people who love Jesus, who are volunteering their time. And it's, it's just a, a privilege, like I said, to be able to worship with you guys. Would you bow your heads uh, with me one more time before we dive in? Lord, we love you. God, we thank you that um, all you are asking for us is uh, for our hearts. God, I pray that we would be able to do that uh, truthfully today, that we would not just be physically present, but that you would help us to be emotionally present, that we would be spiritually aware of your presence with us, that we would be submitted to the counsel of your word, and I pray that by your spirit that you would allow me to convey some truth and that you would allow us, your people, to continue to be challenged and to grow further into the image of Jesus Christ. And so it's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, it is our second to last Sunday in the book of First John, with a, the series we're calling Abide, and this one's kind of a doozy. Uh, as you'll see here, we've got some tables set up, which uh, today we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper, which I'm pretty excited about. It has been much too long since we were able to do that together, and so very excited about that today. And I'm just going to read through. We have a lot of text to cover, um, so we'll just kind of be going a little faster than average, hopefully. <laughs> Uh, but then again, that's a pastor telling you that on a Sunday morning, so that doesn't mean much. But um, let's just go through it, and then we'll see what we can make out of it. First John 4, verse 7 through chapter 5, verse 5. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not know God, anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us, all of us, his Holy Spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and believe the love of God has for us. God is love and whoever abides in him abides in God and God abides in him. By this love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, and yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this is his command that we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. And then chapter 5. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except for the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? We've got a lot to get through, yeah? Man, if you uh, have ears to hear the repetition in that, and, and the Apostle John, who obviously wrote this, uh, was just like the consummate teacher, and he loves the idea of repetition. This is going to be the third time, the third passage in this short little book that John has said some of these things, almost verbatim, word for word, and so it, like in the meta sense, this is the third time we're diving into this idea of love and abiding in God and what that ought to mean for us interrelationally. And then also, uh, in the specific text that we read, the word love, if you include the title of beloved, is mentioned well over 30 times. And so if the Bible says something 30 times, by God's grace, hopefully we can understand that it's sort of a big deal. And so let's just dive in. Beloved. 
let us love one another. And so this is the whole premise of the entire passage. It's, it's pretty simple, and yet it's rather challenging to be able to institute this in our lives. And so he just begins with who we are in Jesus Christ. And time and time again, we come back to this from the Apostle John's viewpoint. Everything we are, which bleeds into everything we do, is rooted and grounded in our identity in Christ Jesus. And so for John, who entitled himself the disciple whom Jesus loved, he wants to share that identity and that security, that foundation with everyone who believes in Jesus. That we begin not with what we ought to be doing, but rather with who we are in Christ Jesus. And so he begins. Beloved church, let us love one another, for love is from God. This word love, as you will hear us harp on very regularly here, uh, as the New Testament was originally written in Greek, uh, that Greek word for the idea of this particular love, one of six or seven, was this agape word. It means an unconditional love. It was often viewed as a radical love simply because it didn't really have to do with emotion. It had nothing to do with sexual attraction, but rather this agape love was a love that you purpose for someone's good, even if it comes at your detriment. Quite obviously, God demonstrates that well for us. And as we'll get into later, uh, John 3.16 comes to mind, right? Hopefully most of you learned it. It is, for God so loved the world that he gave, and then it goes on to explain what he gave and what that did for us. But this love of God is demonstrated by this selfless, sacrificial giving of his one and only son. That God didn't do it because it was fun or easy or quick or painless. In fact, it was quite the opposite of all of those things. And thus he demonstrates what this agape love truly is. The um, writer of Corinthians, which was Paul, uh, kind of elaborates on this, right? In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and he talks about what love is. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy, nor does it boast. Love is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way, nor is it irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rather it rejoices in the truth. This kind of love, it bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. And Paul uh, puts the capstone on that teaching on love by saying this love, this agape love of God, it never fails. So this isn't flimsy love, this isn't mere emotional love, this isn't self-serving love where you love someone only so that they can give you what you feel like you need, but this is so much different from the love that our world is continually trying to foist upon us. It is so much better, so much more rigorous, so much more durable than anything that this world claims as love. And with this biblical God mindset of love, we begin to understand the truth and the depth of what John is really teaching here. Beloved, you who have received this love from God, you also ought to love one another with the same love. And so not only do we begin to celebrate in who we are and what we've received, but if you're anything like me, then you suddenly become really nervous because you understand how hard it is to actually share that kind of love with other people in your life. And so John reminds us, this love is actually from God. You don't have to manufacture this. You don't have to fake it till you make it. In fact, that's quite impossible. But when we begin to understand how this love originated in God and how this love is promulgated through God in our lives, then we begin to understand how large of a role God has and how small of a role we actually play in this. He continues on, whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God simply because God is love. And so with this premise in mind of God being love, John just kind of breaks it out really clearly. If you say you believe in God and you have received his love, then you just quite automatically will reciprocate or share this love with the other people in your life. It's because this love, this powerful love, it is transformative. It is not containable. You couldn't do so even if you wanted to. If you have truly experienced and received and celebrate the love that God has for you, then whether you want to or not, you will find yourselves loving other people with this undeserved, unending, unconditional love. And so John just makes it so clear. And by the way, if you don't have this love, if you can't make yourself love other people, you ought to sober up and take a very, very close look at what you assume is your salvation because something is quite clearly not working here. And John just kind of calls us to the carpet real quick within this teaching by saying anyone who does not love does not actually even know God. This word know, as usual, as John 
uh, has so much meaning in every single word that he penned, and obviously inspired by the Holy Spirit. This word know, it, it's not intellectual. It's not like this theoretical type of knowledge, but rather it's this firsthand experiential knowledge that we're talking out of our own personal experience. And so when he talks about knowing the love of God or not knowing God because you don't have his love, it's, it's not that you just mentally understand and assent to this theology of unconditional love, but rather that you yourself are a recipient and have been blessed by this love of God, and that is how you know God firsthand, not relying on the church or religion or a pastor or your parents or your spouse, but rather you yourself as a soul created in his image have reflected upon and received this love of God. And he caps that off by saying, God is so uh, wrapped up in love. This love is so intricate to his character and to his nature. It's very easy for us to say it's, it's so much a part of our God that we can simply say God is love. That is how important it is to him. And so to be without this love, quite obviously, is to simultaneously be without God. Verse 9, in this is the love of God. In this the love of God was made manifest among us. And so John's going to illustrate how God actually demonstrates this love. This word manifest, um, it means graspable or illuminated. And so John is saying, if that's a little mushy-gushy and you're not actually sure what this loving God who is love uh, how he actually loves you. Well, let's be really explicit. God actually made it graspable. He illuminated it. He made it come into life in the person of Jesus, that God sent his only son into the world that we might live through him. And so John just makes that really clear as, as John wrote in his gospel, right? In John three sixteen, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever Anyone, it's very, very inclusive here that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In verse 17, which arguably is even better than verse 16, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. That's not the point of Jesus is to condemn the world according to John three seventeen. but the point of Jesus was to be sent in order that the world might be saved through him. And so with that context in mind of God sending his only son some translations render that only begotten because this only word, it's jam-packed full of meaning. It means a one of a kind, referring to Jesus is quite clearly the only son of God, but also the kind is God. And so Jesus is one of the kind of God. And so it inextricably links Jesus to the deity of God the Father. So saying not only is he the only one, but he himself simultaneously has the qualities and the perfection of God himself because he shares the identity of God. And so God gave this son, his only begotten son, into the world so that through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you and I might also have the opportunity to live through him. I hope you understand that we're all alive. Obviously, you're here. But what John is talking about is this abundant life of Jesus, this renewal, this spiritual life that happens when we trust in Jesus and we quit trying to manufacture God in our lives or quit trying to please God through uh, these attempts at religion, but rather just give up and give in to Jesus. This is that life that John is talking about, that we might have this abundant life through Jesus Christ. Verse 10, in this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that God has loved us and that he sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. How many of you guys have used the word propitiation uh, this year? Yeah, never. Okay, there you go. Rich has done it. And so this word propitiation is, is this really interesting word. It feels archaic. It feels like, oh, there's another Sunday word that I don't know and that I don't really need to understand. But man, it's, it's so crucial that we get this, this word propitiation, I would argue, is probably alive and well in your life. We see it play itself out in societies, throughout the world religions. It is man's attempt to please God or the gods or a deity or, or to engage in religious behavior to appease our guilty conscience. And so this word propitiation, it, it kind of comes to life in ways when you feel like you need to live a better life or you feel guilty and so you need to be the best you that you can be or when you contemplate your good deeds versus your bad deeds and you really try to work hard so that your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, those are your attempts at propitiating whatever God you believe in. Whether or not you even ascribe to Christianity, all world religions are people's attempts to propitiate or appease God. To propitiate simply means that you understand that you are not God, that you have somehow one way or another offended God, you've, you've crossed him, and that you're trying to make things right with God. 
And so the Christian idea of propitiation, it flies in the face of all other world religions that I'm aware of because it doesn't say try harder, be better, do good works, give more, fix yourself, but rather it says God understood that your relationship with him was broken and you are so utterly helpless and he is simultaneously so utterly loving of you that he did what it took so that you could be made right with him. He actually paid your debt so that you could be settled with the living and loving God. And so with this idea in mind, John is writing to us saying, this is actually how God manifested his love. He himself paid the debt that you owed him. You were his enemy, and he actually did what it took to allow you to become not only his friend, but to be adopted as his sons and daughters. You who are far away by the blood of Jesus, you have been brought near. And so this is the power of the gospel. And again, in verse 10, this is love, not that we loved God. And so John makes this this Christian uh, teaching really clear. You have nothing to offer God that's meaningful. You don't bring anything useful to the table. The only thing that we offer God is our sin and our brokenness. We are utterly a liability and never an asset when we approach God. But when we do so, that is when we begin to recognize this radical love that God has for us. It's not that we loved God and so then he reciprocated and now we're good friends, but rather when we were ignorant of him, when we were arrogant towards his ways, even in the midst of that, God loved us with this unending, unconditional love, this agape love. And when we start to mull that over of what that really means in our lives, it's kind of like we play the role of a real bad teenager, right? Like, God might exist, but we reject his authority. And oftentimes, we might even actually just totally reject the fact that he exists. Is that not like a quintessential teenager sometimes? Yeah? Okay, I thought that'd be a lot funnier than it is, but it's not. So, one of those mornings. And so, what we see here is rather God loving us even in the midst of that. And when you mull that over, it ought to provide within you a lot of stability and security. It might even build your identity in Christ. You can't do anything to make God love you more today. In fact, in the converse of that, you can't do anything today that would make God love you less. Does that challenge some of your guys' ideas of who God is? If you went out and made some horrible mistakes, did some really self-destructive behavior, burned some bridges, harmed someone in some way or another, God won't love you less. That's the whole point of unconditional love. Nothing you can do will will raise the volume of God's love, nor can anything you do diminish the amount of love that God has for you. God loved you before you knew he existed. God loved you when you were still lost in your sin. And so coming to him, how much more secure ought you to be now that you receive this unconditional love of the Father? And remember that it is because of Jesus and his blood that was shed for us. It is that propitiation for our sins. Verse 11, beloved, If God has so loved us, we who are broken and liabilities, we who vacillate and so often claim to love God with our words, but in our heart of hearts and in our actions behind closed doors, we know that there are things in our life that we love more. And yet God still, he still loves us. He still receives us. He continues to forgive us when we confess those sins as John has already talked about in this book. But if we understand this, that if God so loved us in this brokenness, then we also ought to love one another. This word ought is interesting. Uh, It's actually a word that is often uh, is the case in the New Testament. It's kind of like this court uh, legal type of word. It means that we are indebted. We are legally obligated to one another. And so John draws this really interesting parallel saying, if you have received this love of God that you don't deserve, nor will you ever, then you are legally obligated under the law of God to share this love with one another. And specifically in this context, John is referring to members of the church. He's referring to believers, fellow Christians who are in your faith community. Quite obviously, we need to love every human being, but very specifically, John is dealing with this church. And so he just kind of nails us to the carpet. If you have ever found consolation in God's love, if you have ever once say that you received it and it has transformed your life, then doggone it, you are, you are indebted to one another to love each other with the same radical, unconditional, undeserved love that the Father has for us. And is that not annoying? Because you guys are hard to love, right? I mean, let's just be real. You are thinking of people probably in this room and you're like, it might just be easier if I convince myself they're not saved 
and then I don't actually owe them this love. That's, that's not good either, okay? Like someone has that role and his name is God Almighty. So like don't just be playing that game. But when we come down to it, I, I get that the scripture sounds nice and flowery and this is so idealistic, but I know that I'm hard for you guys to love. I know that some of you guys are especially hard for me to love. It, it just happens. Uh, there you go. <laughs> so uh, thanks for being here my last Sunday. And uh, whoever the elders replace me with, uh, God bless them, right? And so when, when it comes down to the nitty gritty, I, I get that this is hard. I get that we rub each other wrong. I understand that our closet doctrines, that we might not see eye to eye, we might have some very strong disagreements with one another, even in the most basic elemental parts of our Christian faith. And how much more will we disagree on finance and leisure time and how to rear our kids and particularly in how we play out our Christian faith and politics. But when we lay all of that aside, John is saying, I could not care less about your worldly squabbles. If you say you have received the love from Christ, God bless you and take heart in that and rejoice in your new identity. And I hope that that moves you towards praising God with all that you have. But in the midst of that, you've got to realize for your faith to be real, for your faith to be congruent, that love needs to be expressed with one another. That we also ought to love one another. And then he throws this at us in verse 12. No one has ever seen God. And, and, and this is kind of hard to get because there's some pretty clear verses in the Old Testament that talk about people seeing God. But what I take this to mean is, is no one has ever comprehensively grasped the person of God in, in all of his fullness and richness with all the different facets of his character and the, the infinite, limitless boundaries of who he is. No one has ever truly, comprehensively seen God. However, if we love one another, church, God's love will abide in us. And his love will be perfected in us. And in essence, what John is saying is, is no one this side of eternity will ever totally know and understand God. But it is up to us who have received that love to demonstrate this living God in this world. That God will live through us. His love will, will push through us as if we were just a pipe or a conduit that God is allowing his love to enter this world through. And what a cool picture that you are just a walking conduit that the everlasting, unconditional love of God wants to be passed through to everyone you come in contact with. And with that idea in mind, John is writing this. People can't see God, but they can see God through you. I understand it's temporary. I understand it's not perfect. But what if you're the best chance someone has this week of seeing and receiving the everlasting love of God? What an incredible, inspiring gift that we have been given to share this wonderful love of God with people who have not yet seen it. Verse 13, by this we know that we abide in him and that he abides in us because he has given us his spirit. And this comforts me. This makes me take a deep breath of relief. I don't have to make up this love. I don't have to conjure up this love. I don't have to pretend to love you guys because the spirit alive in me and the spirit alive in you guys will allow us to love with this love of God. So by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us the power of his spirit. We have seen and we have testified that the Father sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses this, that Jesus is the Son of God, well, this is it. God abides in him, and he abides in God. So we have come to know and to believe that the love of God, what the love of God has for us. And I love that, just that first chunk of verse 16. We have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. If you miss everything else of today, of, of the entire sermon series, man, would you, would you read and memorize and meditate upon this? That you would come to know in a first-person experiential sense the love of God. That you would come to believe. This word means you've been persuaded. Almost as if you really were, didn't want to at first, but because of the overwhelming evidence of God's love, you simply had to assent to the truth that it was real and that specifically it was for you. And I think one of the errors in church, and, and I, I'm sorry if I contribute to this, is we generally paint God's love as like this universal, global, everlasting thing. And it almost becomes so big that we forget specifically God loves you. Yeah. And, and when you think, no, because I'm broken and I've done these things and I've had all these liabilities and if he only knew, he does. Yeah, and, and he still loves you. And, and this, this ought to change the way that we look at ourselves. And may we, Anthem, be a church that knows and believes the love that God has for us as individuals. 
One more time, John says it. God is love. It is so intrinsic to who he is that, that you can't separate him. God is love. And, and obviously, he's more than love. He is righteous and he is just. And because of his love for us, he utterly hates the sin in this world that destroys us in his creation. And it is not at all hypocritical or incongruent to say God is love and simultaneously God hates sin. And that, that works. And so it's not as if this is a hypocritical teaching in Christianity. So God is love and whoever abides in him, in love abides God and God abides in him. I wrote that wrong. Whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. That's a lot of abiding. Verse 17, by this the love of God is perfected in us, so that we, we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. This is the, the, the radical, transformative love God has for us. When God looks at you, you who believe in Christ Jesus, he doesn't see a mess up, he doesn't see a sinner, he does not feel anger and wrath towards you. But just as John says, as Jesus is in this world, so also are we. When God looks at us, he sees the blood of Jesus that covers us from all sin. He sees us as saints and as righteous, as blameless, as pure in his sight. And all of those are direct quotes from scripture as how God sees his children. And so we begin to understand this love that we receive. It changes and it transforms us and it changes the way we view God. We're, we don't have to be afraid of him anymore. We don't have to be fearful of that day of judgment, but rather we are children with confidence. Verse 18, this explains why there is no fear in love. The more you know God, the more you will love God. And the more you love God, you just can't be afraid of him and simultaneously love him because there is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out all fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. He says this one more time in case we get elevated or bloated. Listen, we love because and only because he first loved us. We only love because he has opened our eyes and allowed us to love him. And so with that in mind, one more time, John is saying, if anyone says, quote unquote, I love God, but simultaneously hates a member of the church or of the Christian faith, well, let's not mince words as John says. You're a liar. You've missed the point. Your false salvation has deluded you, and you don't understand this God of love. You can't receive that love or claim to and not share that love with other people. And as John says just really, really clearly and very offensively, you're a liar. And these are strong enough words, church, that I hope they shake some of your security, at least enough to reconsider, how are you doing in this? Do you love the church with, with this selfless, unconditional love of the Spirit? Not something you're making up, not something you're pretending, but in your heart of hearts you know that there is unforgiveness there. But rather, do you love the church, or at least are you growing in your capacity to do so? As John says, as you are being perfected in love. If you are capable of not loving brothers and sisters, you ought to be worried. If you are fine with having a wake of disaster and broken relationships without any attempt of restoration, there is something very, very wrong in what you call your salvation. That we as believers, we ought to be the first to make things right. We ought to be the first to lay down our lives as Christ did and figure out how we can restore relationships that have been broken. We ought to excel as Christians at conflict resolution. And if none of that exists in your life, you ought to take a very, very sober look at what you suppose is your Christianity. For he who does not love his brother, whom he cannot, he, let me start that over. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this is the commandment that we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. So chapter five, this is how John kind of wraps it up with some to-do lists. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ, don't worry, you have been born of God. Everyone who loves a father simultaneously has been born of him. By this, we know that we love the children of God. How? When we love God and obey his commandments. John writing here, who obviously was a disciple of Christ, uh, who quoted Christ in John 14, 15, Jesus said very explicitly, if you love me, keep my commandments. And his commandments are to love one another. And so these are all inextricably mixed. You can't just love Jesus without obeying him. And if you're obeying him, you're obviously going to be loving one another. And if you love one another, it's proof positive that you love Jesus Christ. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. By the way, his commandments are not burdensome. Some of us have a really hard time with this. 
We, we are, are kind of being deceived, and the world always loves to tell us that God's commands, they're life-sucking. They make you less fun. They restrict you from things that you wish you could do. They make you silence the urges of your flesh and your appetites. And these rules of God just box you in and make you a miserable, pathetic, weak human being. And Scripture is so different from that. Scripture is saying the commands of God are actually put in place so that you can thrive and you can live the abundant life and you can be free from guilt and shame and brokenness and so that you can walk into this life that Christ has for you instead of dwelling in a land of sin. And so this is very specific. The commands of God, they're not burdensome. And if you think they are, there are some errors in your heart that you need to confess to the Lord and work out with a community of faith. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. That Greek word there is, is the sporting goods uh, name. It's Nike, right? And it means to prevail. It means to conquer. It means to have victory. It obviously implies that you have been through battle and you have come out the other side as a victor. And it's, it's so encouraging for us to remember this, that, that we are more than conquerors in this world anthem, that whoever has been born of God has overcome the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world. It's not your good behavior. It's not your lineage. It's not how well your parents did or did not raise you, but it's only one thing. It is our faith in Christ. He ends with this rhetorical question, who is it then that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? And so I'm going to invite um, some help to go, whoever you are, to go get the communion stuff. I'm going to invite the worship team back up here. Jesus, um, in his last night on earth, which uh, if you are a believer, I know you are aware of, um, I'm going to be reading out of Luke chapter 22. Uh, in the upper room, the Last Supper, right before Jesus is arrested in the garden, uh, he's sharing one last Passover meal, and he says, uh, and he took the bread, Jesus took the bread, and when he had given thanks, Jesus broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, Jesus said, this cup is poured out for you. It is the new covenant in my blood. And Jesus instituted what we call communion or the Lord's Supper. It is, it is a celebration of the costly love that God has demonstrated on your behalf. It celebrates this act of propitiation that you were not right with God and you were his enemy and you owed him something you could never pay. And because God loves you, he took care of all of that. And so when we celebrate communion, we not only celebrate this costly love of God, but it's us invoking this in our own life, that we ourselves will give up our lives for the God who loved us. It is us putting into action with, with this multi-sensory experience where we see and we taste and we touch and we smell, that we comprehensively worship God by reenacting what Jesus did for us. So we liken ourselves to the loving God, we demonstrate our love in return to him, and also we do it as a community of faith which binds us together, and it says, beyond our differences, and apart from our brokenness and our foibles and our humanity, we ourselves, we purpose to love one another with this love that we here celebrate because of the love of Jesus Christ. And so if you are here and you are a believer, uh, as Paul mentions in Corinthians, he says, before you do this, this is so big of a deal that you need to check your heart. Because you are an utter hypocrite if you're going to take this and celebrate the blood of Jesus, but there's someone in this room that you are offended at and that you're harboring a grudge over and that you have broken relationship with. And so Paul says, go first and fix that and then perfectly in integrity, worship the Lord your God through communion. And if you're here and, and, and this just isn't your cup of tea and you are not a believer, just relax. Like you don't have to take part of this. This, this really honestly doesn't have to do with you. This has to do with those of us who identify ourselves with the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And so I encourage you to take a moment, reflect on this love that I sincerely hope you have received, and then when you feel ready, come and partake of the elements. There's some in the back, some in the front. We have gluten-free also if that is something that you will need. If you are here and you do not yet belong to Jesus, we would love to introduce you to him, to help walk you into his family and so that you yourself can experience this life and this love that yes he has for you and so we're going to have a prayer team up here after service and we would love to connect with you if you are willing but first would you guys bow your heads and pray with me lord that line how great the love the father has for us keeps echoing in my mind 
God, I pray that everyone in this room would joyfully proclaim your goodness because we have seen and we have experienced and we know your love personally. God, help us not to, to stop there in a hypocritical state, but as a church, Lord Jesus, help us to, to know by the power of your spirit how we can love one another. Help us demonstrate our authentic faith by doing so, Lord Jesus. We thank you for your spirit that allows that to be true and not just some religious game that we try to do ourselves, but that we can rely on you so that you can help us to obey your commands. As we receive the communion elements, Lord Jesus, would you remind us again of your love? Would you remind us again of the transformation that has taken place? And may you be glorified in our hearts, Lord Jesus. Amen.